Whoa, that looks incredible. You really get to see this from the airplane? That is crazy cool. Uh, I wish I could really go here right now. Well, hello wonderful person. Just like many of us today, I'm pretty much stuck here, unable to travel, unable to go anywhere and, well, stuck in a hotel of all places, making videos. Now because my editing equipment hasn't really arrived yet, and because I'm limited to making much simpler videos, and also because I really wish I could go places and see things and meet people, just like many of you, I decided to give the new flight simulator a try. And oh my god, it blew my mind. You get to travel to a lot more places than even Google Earth that used to allow me to. And most importantly, all of this is created in extremely realistic environments. By the way, totally not sponsored by anyone. Microsoft doesn't really want to talk to me because I run Linux and I don't really use Microsoft products, I guess except for this one. But I only paid a dollar for this, I get to use it for a month, so why not? And oh my god, did I discover a whole new world. So in this video and possibly the next few videos, I wanted to actually go explore places and more specifically explore some of the most incredible craters on our planet, some of which you may have never heard of, like for example this one right here about which we'll talk about soon. Maybe not in this video, but soon. This is probably the coolest crater I've ever seen. It is absolutely mind blowing. So we'll go explore them, we'll find out what created them and fly around in Flight Simulator because, well, because we can't really go anywhere right now. And so on that note, let's begin our adventure in Flight Simulator and visit some of the coolest places on the planet. Beginning with probably the most famous crater on the planet or at least the most famous in the United States. The crater and originally known as the Meteor Crater. Which is actually kind of incorrect because meteors don't strike Earth. Meteorites do, that's kind of the definition. But it's also known as the Behringer Crater and this is exactly what you see right here from the airplane and it's named after Daniel Behringer who was the first to suggest that it was an impact crater to begin with. And by the way, if you have flight simulator as well or even if you essentially go on Google Earth and enter the same thing that I'm doing right now, you'll be able to see this for yourself as well. All of this can be found on the Wikipedia for each of the craters and essentially what you want are the coordinates right here and then click on the Google map and get these coordinates right here. Then inside the flight simulator on the world map, all you have to do is paste all of this in here, choose the location, then once you set it as a departure, you can click on fly and begin. I personally find this airplane to be one of the easiest to control and to fly over something at relatively slow speeds, but there are other ones you can choose from. By the way, I actually didn't want to choose Icon A5, mostly because it does have a relatively low reputation for being somewhat unsafe. In the past few years, these uh, so-called sports airplanes have resulted in several major crashes simply because of their small size. They're a lot more difficult to control and even professional pilots have trouble with them. So if you do have an actual urge to fly a real airplane, I would go with something a little bit more, well, bigger, Cessna for example. But anyway, completely off topic. Let's begin. So here it is, the Behringer Crater in Arizona. And um, as you can see, it's not super big, but it's also not particularly small either. Here, I believe the, oh, by the way, there's also the visitor center right there. And we can even fly over it as well. But first, let's fly through the center. Apparently it's approximately 170 meters deep or about 560 feet uh, deep. And the rim itself is about 45 meters. So that makes it a pretty large crater. In terms of the actual diameter, it's about 1200 meters or about 3000 or sorry, 3900 feet. And that thing is about 50,000 years old. And this means that it was created when the humans were most likely not here yet. So there was no one to see it. This is the visitor center that apparently looks just like that in real life as well. Cars, I'm not sure about. Anyway, so as you can see, it's a very, very beautiful formation, extremely beautiful, um, even more beautiful in real life, obviously, but this is the best we can do for now. And this uh, crater is actually even big enough for us to land in, although I'll probably not be attempting it here because I wanted to leave this for another crater later on. Anyway, so this is probably the most famous location in the US when it comes to impact craters. And interestingly, one of the main reasons why it's still even around and hasn't really weathered much is simply because of the Arizona climate. It's just too dry here, there's not enough rain, and overall the weathering in deserts is usually the reason why we also find a lot of craters in deserts around the world. But let's actually see this from a little bit higher up as well, and also talk about what created this thing. And despite the relatively large size of this crater, and by the way I can't really seem to get much higher in this tiny airplane, the object that created it was roughly around 50 meters or 130 feet across. It wasn't really that big. It was moving pretty fast, it was moving at about 13 kilometers per second, 
but it wasn't big at all. But despite all of this, once it collided with this region, it created a really large explosion, equivalent to one of the largest nuclear bombs ever detonated. It was about 10 megatons in power. And this is what you're going to discover with most of the craters on the planet. The craters that are very quite easily visible and the ones that are slightly younger are the ones that were created by relatively smaller rocks. Whereas the largest craters, like the one that led to the demise of dinosaurs, or even the most recently discovered very large crater in Greenland that's not marked here, which are usually at least 20 kilometers in diameter, were produced by much, much larger rocks. Normally something that's at least one kilometer in size. And these types of craters are usually millions of years old, are also extremely difficult to find, and are not generally apparent unless you start investigating what's underneath the ground there. One of the best examples of this in the United States is the Decora Crater in Iowa that you can only really see once you start studying the geology of the region. As you can see, it's roughly around 6 kilometers or 4 miles in diameter and was probably created by something about 100 times more powerful than whatever created this here. So in that sense, as you can see, for the most part, we're going to be seeing these smaller craters a lot more frequently. As a matter of fact, the vast, vast majority of all of the craters on the planet are long gone. We still have some very small craters left, like the Behringer that's right here, and a few other ones we're going to be exploring in this simulation, but most of the craters are unfortunately no longer there. And by the way, if you'd like to see all of the craters on our planet in more detail, the Earth Impact Database has all of the information about 190 craters we've found so far. Here's what all of this sort of looks like, and you'll see that the majority of them are in deserts. Moon, on the other hand, has over 5,000 large craters and over a million craters that are either similar in size or larger than this right here. So this kind of shows you how our planet has been really good at hiding these things. And so finding and seeing something like this on our planet is relatively rare. If you ever got to see this, you can consider yourself pretty lucky. But we should probably also go explore some of the other ones in other countries, um, especially because some of the other craters look very different and also have some really, really cool features there that this one doesn't have. Let's go to Australia. The next crater is known as the Wolf Creek Crater. Let's select the coordinates, jump to Australia, select this as departure once again, and here we go. We find ourselves in a completely different environment. Now I'm going to have trouble controlling the plane while trying to talk and also look at the camera and also do a lot of other things. But basically, there it is. This is the crater we're here to visit. It's very different from the uh, Behringer crater, also known as the Meteor crater. And what's interesting here is that even though the size in terms of diameter is not really that much smaller, this is about 3000 feet or about 875 meters in diameter and about 60 meters or 200 feet in depth. This here was created by something that was about three times smaller. It was only about 15 meters in size or about 50 feet in size. And that is kind of mind blowing when you think about it. The idea here is that it most likely um, hit Earth at a different angle and also at a much, much larger speed. So it did create an explosion that was roughly similar in terms of the actual um, energy. And this explosion occurred roughly around 120,000 years ago. So here's the interesting part. There is actually at least one known legend um, that the Aborigines here have, and that's the people that lived in Australia for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and interestingly, it does have a description that almost sounds like they witnessed the meteorite strike itself. The local Jaro Aboriginals uh, refer to this as the Kandi Malal. And one of the stories the Aborigines have about this crater is in regards to a moon, a crescent moon, and an evening star passing by very close to each other. And according to them, the evening star became so hot that it fell to the ground, causing an enormous explosion and flash, which was also followed by a very large dust cloud. Now, that sure sounds like a meteorite strike. And honestly, this kind of means two things. Either this happened within the last 50,000 years when the Aborigines were already present in Australia, or they came here to Australia much, much earlier and were able to witness this within the last 120,000 years. Either one of these would actually make for a really interesting study in history of Australia and, of course, in uh, trying to understand when this collision happened. And also, according to the legend, the people were also extremely scared to visit this area, and by the time they got here, um, it did look like something smacked into the planet, which is why the legend involves, I guess, a kind of a collision to begin with. 
What's interesting about the Australian Aborigines is that a lot of their traditions are oral and they're also passed from generation to generation for thousands and thousands of years, for practically at least 50,000 years. And at least a few do sort of sound like telltale signs of asteroid collisions um, that were witnessed by nearby Aborigines. At least one of them also involved the potentially poisonous gas that this created, which altogether means that Aborigines could actually be some of the oldest eyewitnesses that have been able to keep the records of these events through generation of storytelling and all sorts of songs and other oral traditions that they have. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool, but um, does this actually look like it does in real life? Well, let's take a look at the picture and see if this compares to reality. Here's a wonderful picture I found on Flickr from Stefan Ridgway who took this with his drone and this looks absolutely mind-blowing. Especially because this one seems to lack the ridge itself, but we have a cool looking forest in the middle and uh, something that's very similar to a salt deposit that we're going to discover in one of the other craters later on. Anyway, so discovering these places definitely gave me a kind of a sense of liberation that we all need in these relatively difficult times. So this is crater number two, the Wolf Creek Crater. Let's go to the next one. This one is going to be a little bit different. We're now going to Germany and there is a city that was built inside one of the larger craters on the planet. This is the city known as Nordlingen and you can kind of sort of see it right there underneath the airplane. And so here, if you look down, you can kind of start seeing the circular shape. Now here is the tricky part. I actually thought that this was the crater itself. As a matter of fact, a lot of sources online do suggest that essentially this is the crater and the city is inside a crater, with the shape of the impact being defined by the city shape, which apparently is not true at all, because the crater itself is much, much larger. And the city itself only representing a tiny part of the crater, but interestingly, all of the buildings, all of the walls, and pretty much everything else in the city is made out of the meteorite material, which also means that Every single building here has micro diamonds on the inside, which makes this one of the most fascinating places on the planet. As you can see in this picture from NASA, the city itself is here and the center of the impact is roughly around 6 kilometers or about 4 miles to the northeast of the location. This is about 15 kilometers in diameter and is roughly around 15 million years old and it was also most likely created by a rock around um, 1 kilometer in diameter. So these types of collisions are pretty rare. But the analysis of various types of rocks in this, specifically the rocks that these houses are made from, suggested that around 72,000 tons of micro diamonds were released in this area when the asteroid strike occurred and when this crater was created. But this doesn't mean that you should come here to try to mine for diamonds inside one of these buildings. These micro diamonds are pretty small, they're roughly around 0.2 millimeters in size. That's very, very tiny. Nevertheless, if someone one day finds a way to extract these micro diamonds and turn them into some sort of an industry, this town of 19,000 is going to be pretty rich. By the way, the only thing that's missing from our simulation, which as you can see otherwise looks pretty realistic, is this central and relatively famous St. George Church that's entirely produced from the meteorite material. And as far as I know, it makes it the only church in the world to be produced from interplanetary material. But anyway, so that's the three craters I wanted to show you in this video, but I'm actually going to keep exploring and keep flying around looking for more exciting craters. And in the next video that's going to be coming out most likely tomorrow, I'm also going to show you another really interesting crater I discovered in Canada, something that most people don't really know about, and it's the one that you saw in the beginning. So let's see what else I can discover while flying around the planet by being stuck in a hotel, and I'll see you tomorrow. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this, let me know if there's anything else you'd like to see in a flight simulator. And most importantly, stay positive, stay wonderful, and don't forget, all of this negativity and all of this nonsense is going to go away pretty soon. On that note, I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe support this channel either on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. And by the way, this is not really sponsored by Microsoft, but I actually do recommend, especially right now, to try this, especially if your computer can handle Flight Simulator. This game so far has been extremely relaxing, it actually gave me a lot of peace of mind, and um, I finally got to explore places I probably would never visit otherwise. 
If you go to Microsoft's website or if you just go to the Xbox Gaming, you can find a subscription uh, for, I believe it's called Xbox PC Gaming. Um, that's only a dollar. It's a dollar for the first month and I think after that it becomes like five bucks or something. But I wanted to try this for a month to see how it goes and so far I've been really enjoying it. Now, honestly, Microsoft, you finally did a good job in one thing. I have been pretty critical about Microsoft in the past, but this has been pretty amazing. Anyway, so here we go. I'm going to try to land in Nordlingen. As I promised in the beginning, we're going to try to land in the creator bot. Oh, okay, it's not going well so far because I'm not paying attention to the important part here, which is, of course, landing. I'm talking and recording at the same time. And here we go. Here we go. Hopefully, it's not too Kerbal Space style. Hopefully, I'll actually do it. Whoa, we did it. Uh, kind of. Okay, here we go again. Let's try this one more time. This time, slightly slower and slightly better approach. And most importantly, do not talk and uh, record while you try to land your airplane, because apparently it's very dangerous. Here we go. Okay, success. Sort of. Oh no. Oh no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. Still good. Very good. All right. I'll see you guys in the next video. And uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay wonderful. Space out. Bye-bye. Did I, did I crash? No. I'm still good. Okay, very good.